So this morning, uh, for the month of November, we are coming into year end where there, your uh, inboxes and mailboxes and every other place is uh, inundated with give here. We're the special ones that you should give to more, you know. And so, um, uh, again, the message that you hear from us is uh, listen to God. Uh, check your heart, you know. Uh, be all that you are meant to be in his kingdom. Respond to that. And so, uh, let's start a series on these next few weeks that's just talking about living in generosity grace, or the graces of generosity. Generosity as a disciplined lifestyle, rather than just in a way of like dumping a whole lot of something to something in one given moment in time. So, you can um, be, you can give a lot of money in just a moment to one calls, but maybe you're not generous as you do that. You might just be sympathetic. You might just be feeling pity, or you might be feeling guilty, or you might be feeling something else. And so, what we're looking for as we give these calls to be asking the Lord what our giving should be here, what your giving should be into other places as well, is that you're doing it from a place of where we're always doing this, being on mission with Jesus, right? Where we're doing this as being disciples of Jesus, and as we're being discipled by Him, we're being discipled into living in His graces. So, we want to be talking about these uh, generosity graces, graces that are God-given, God-inspired, Holy Spirit-inspired, but they're not automatic. They need to be practiced. They need to be uh, experienced. They need to be um, uh, uh, put into our… Yes, dear. Um, into our lives more and more, one after another. Um, there's the story of, uh, of a person observing a professional golfer, and the golfer hit a great shot, and the ball rolled right into the hole, and the guy observing said, wow, that was a lucky shot. And the golfer turns to him and say, and you know, the more I practice, the luckier I get, Right? And so, that's how it is. The more we practice generosity, the more we do it from a heart that's open to be trained by God, the more His blessing is there, the more we're able to be contributing into His kingdom in that way. So, Jesus… so so we're looking at generosity as a spiritual discipline this month, all right? Uh, So, let's talk about this discipline um, uh, is… uh, we, we, have, we have different meanings for the word, right? With a child uh, and a parent's talking about discipline, it's, it's like some sort of a, 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 a intervention, a corrective measure, right? Uh, we don't like to say punishment these days, we say consequence, okay? And so, yes, at times God is giving consequences to His people as well, okay? So, one way of giving a discipline, right? But, but another way is, uh, is uh, uh, what's, your, what's your discipline of study, right? What's the area that you're studying? That you're, what's, your, what's your study, focus, and expertise? It's another kind of discipline. There could be certain things that you would ask me about, and I'll know more than the average in this room. There'll be another things that you can ask me about, and I'll be at the bottom end of the class in that, right? and probably for all of you in whatever those areas are as well. Uh, a third area is of discipline, is a discipline that, uh, that, uh, that uh, an athlete needs to have, right? Uh, practice. I'm looking right here at these two young athletes right here and, and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and just saying, if you, if you just uh, kick the ball whenever you feel like it, you're probably not going to be as good as if you are practicing, right? And as you're training and getting into shape and doing all kinds of things to have your muscles be, be, uh, be uh, working together. Um, uh, last week, um, uh, part of my Ravens fandom here, but the Ravens lost a game because they were dropping a lot of balls that came their ways. They were like bouncing out of their hands. 
So I was very pleased to hear that there were special exercises they were going through this week to be on the jugs machine, which is where the balls are just like shot out at them and they have to like learn how to use their hands to catch them, right? It's like, you need that discipline, Ravens. We'll see whether it helped today at one o'clock, okay? Well, Jesus chose His 12 disciples to lead them into a disciplined way of following Him. You hear that word, right? Disciple, disciplined, the disciplined ones in following Jesus. That's what we want to be about. Not, not being punished into following Jesus, but that every day practice aligning because there's a goal that we want to have to be spiritually fit in shape followers of Jesus so that we can be fulfilling the mission that He has for us, and thus we are His disciples. We live into these disciplines that He wants us to carry so that we are able to do what all He wants us to do. So the disciples, you know, the, 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 uh, the, uh, the gospels are full of how they change, but at many times slowly and unevenly, and sometimes two steps forward and one and a half steps backward, and you think they're making progress, and then, and, and then they don't get it. And uh, one of the uh, uh, best portrayals of this in uh, pictorial form is the multi-season miniseries called The Chosen, right? And by the way, there's, uh, we're doing watch parties with The Chosen Series 4 right now, and you can check with, uh, with uh, Scott um, after the service to see how to get in on that. But the chosen are the disciples, right? And so they, the chosen ones, are the ones who are uh, learning what it means to be following Jesus and their bewilderment and their surprise and their being daunted by what Jesus is expecting of them and what He's not expecting of them. And, uh, and, uh, and, and so there they are learning, growing, being discipled by Jesus. Well, I want to really stretch here and go into a, um, um, I mean, I'm not a whole lot of an athlete, and I use that as an illustration. Now let me go even further and say uh, sometimes being, being uh, uh, living in this grace generosity is, is, is like uh, ballet dancing. Now I'm really on shaky ground because I know nothing about that, all right? Um, so uh, it's a bit of a risk, but, uh, but uh, here goes, Okay. So give me grace if I get this wrong. But, uh, but uh, when I see ballet dancers or, or, or uh, other types of dancing, it's like it, it, it feels like this effortless flow, right? There's this grace. There's this movement. There's this, uh, it's, it's, it's like, wow, what ease and effortless flow that is. Uh, the the uh, pirouettes, the, uh, whatever other twists and twirls and things that they do, uh, but, but it's like then you do it all on the tip of your toes. It's like it's, it's astounding, right? Um, but it, I, I mean, I don't do that. Do you do that? Do you do that, Samson? Could you? Okay, great. I, I didn't think so. All right. Um, so, so, so natural skill, perhaps, natural aptitude, but aptitude that's honed with much practice, right? So that this discipline is made to look effortless, is made to look, you know, this free-flowing, um, and uh, that's why I like that script there, from the heart with compassion. Uh, that looks like this is like this free-flowing ease, but this creativity that God asks us into that is this result of, of being disciplined. Um, Jesus... Uh, healed when he was here on this earth. And then in Acts 3 and 4, after Jesus had gone back to the Father, uh, Peter and John are walking up to the temple one day, and they um, uh, are used of the Lord to heal this man who was crippled and was by the temple gate many years. And um, uh, he, they then, uh, good for this guy, but bad for the authorities because he was stealing their airtime he was cutting into their um, approval ratings and things like that. And so, uh, they, they, they bring Peter and John, the authorities, the Jewish authorities bring Peter and John in for questioning. And they say, what happened here? What do you, you know, and just, they're questioning, they're questioning, and then they uh, uh, pull themselves away from Peter and John, and then they say, you know, 
one thing we have to acknowledge is that these men have been with Jesus. It's like that's what we're talking about. We're talking about being disciplined, living in spiritual disciplines, right? Is that we're, we're carrying the image, the graces of what it is that Jesus' life was graced with when He was here. We're practicing it so that we are becoming more and more like Jesus so that people look at us and say, they are Jesus' people. They're people that emulate Jesus, that walk with Him, who carry His characteristics out into wherever they go, into the corporate world, into the boardrooms, into the, into the classrooms, into the uh, office spaces, wherever it is, onto um, uh, your, uh, your uh, neighborhoods, your sports fields, wherever it is that, uh, that uh, your life takes you. So that there's this core grace that God wants to be building into us that carries His heart of God, which is a generous heart, right? God gave generously to us, and then He calls us to be like Him and to give generously in return. Generosity is a vital body of Christ function. That's a characteristic of that body. When, when a generosity happens, you wonder, do those people belong to Jesus? Because it's the nature of what it means to live that life. But, uh, but uh, generosity doesn't just happen. It needs other factors to be there to really flow and to have grace. One of those is, is, a, uh, is that we're cultivating gratitude in our lives. Another one is that we're cultivating humility in our lives, that in this atmosphere of gratitude and humility is where the Jesus-like characteristic of generosity flourishes. So there can be an act or there can be a, a lifestyle, right? This generous lifestyle is what we're talking about. But first of all, just uh, 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 that, that, that we need to be doing this in humility. Uh, the opposite would be narcissism, right? Uh, and, and, and so, uh, a narcissistic person might drop a large sum of money into a certain location, right? Which isn't about being generous, it's about what that person expects to get out of that instead, right? So, I'll give to this charity, but I'm doing it so that you all notice it, so that you all respond in a certain way, so that you who are part of it feel obligated to me, and it ends up being a quid pro quo relationship. It's a social transaction rather than an act of this giving with no thought of return nature that God plants within us. In John chapter 3, Jesus talking to Nicodemus. And these famous words, let's look at them together. Uh, Chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. You know them, many of you. This is how God loved the world. He gave His one and only Son so that everyone who believes in Him will not perish but have eternal life. God sent His Son into the world not to judge the world but to save the world through Him. He gave. He gave all the sons that He had. It's not like God had three sons or five sons and He said, I think I can spare one. It's like this was a one-shot effort to give of, of who He is, the essence of God coming into, <coughs> into human life. Then also this word in verse uh, 17 uh, that says, but to save the world through Him. The Son of God sent, given to this earth, sent by God to, to uh, live here. This world save can be translated also into our English word healed or made whole. God sent Jesus to heal us, to heal the world, to make us whole again. Do you feel that? That this is about what happens in this world as well as what happens in the world, in the, in the New Jerusalem that is to come that we were talking about. Let's put up the photo of just uh, uh, catching this, um, catching this uh, image of Jesus. There we are, we come to Jesus, we give ourselves to Him, 
we just are uh, broken from whatever it is, our life experiences. Maybe it's something we did that we're ashamed of. Maybe it's uh, 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 disasters that have happened to us, whatever it is. And Jesus' arms of love and compassion are reaching out, surrounding us, and is holding us. And we hear the words of Jesus saying, as He said to the woman who was caught in adultery, neither do I condemn you. Go and live a new life that lives in my grace, my courage, my power that's built into you because you now have relationship with me. So it's a call to live in the righteousness of redeemed life of Christ, a compassion that is there being shown from Jesus. A generous heart, the avenue is an avenue of compassion. And all the time in the Scriptures, Jesus is saying, um, or, 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 or the Scripture says of Jesus, the compassion of God moves through Him, and He reaches out, and He touches. The compassion of God moves in you, and the generosity is placed in your heart is extended, and you reach out and you touch. The image is this image of Jesus on the cross with His arms reached out, His compassion, His generosity. It's not, it's not this. It's not closed off. It's not the, the, uh, the uh, hands in introspection, which, which is uh, often the case of, uh, of uh, images of Buddha, for example, or of other world religions. The image of the cross, the image of Jesus, is with His hands reached out, the scars in the hands saying, come to me, that generous, compassionate image. Well, many times Jesus expressed that. Let's look at one of those times and read from the uh, account in Mark where He's multiplying the food. So, Mark 6, verse 30, the apostles gathered around Jesus and reported to Him all they had done and taught. And then, because so many people were coming and going that they did not even have a chance to eat, He said to them, come with Me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. So they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place. But many who saw them leaving recognized them and ran on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, He had compassion on them because they were like a sheep without a shepherd. So He began to teach them many things. And in Matthew's account it said, and He began uh, uh, to, uh, to uh, heal them. So this time it's late in the day, and the disciples came to him. This is a remote place, they said. It's already very late. Send the people away so that they can go to the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. How many of you have ever given a suggestion to God and he thought it was a good idea? You, we have, yeah, I mean, the disciples are experiencing the same thing, right? But Jesus answers, you give them something to eat. And they're saying, how is that possible? Look at the cost. Look at what it would cost us. Look at what it would be. Look at the sacrifice that, that would take half a year's wages. Are we to go and spend that much on one meal? Jesus says, what do you have? How many loaves do you have? Go and see. They said, we found five loaves and two fish. Just to pause here, isn't it great how Jesus always involves us? It's not like Jesus was saying, you know, if only I had a starter kit, I could multiply it, right? He's like, he could have done it out of nothing, right? But he's like, what do you have? What do you have? Will you come? Will you bring it to me? Will you watch how I multiply it for the sake of this generous hearted compassion that I want to be revealing to the people. So Jesus directed them all to sit down on the green grass. They sat down in groups of hundreds and fifties, taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven. He gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then He gave them to His disciples to distribute to the people. He also divided the two fish among them. They ate, were satisfied. The disciples picked up twelve basketfuls of broken pieces of bread and fish and they brought it to the CCF food pantry to distribute. The number of men who had eaten was 5,000. Okay, you can show the picture of, of, of the uh, 5,000 there just to put it in our... Okay, so the disciples had been on this missionary journey. They're likely very exhausted. Um, 
serving the Lord, being out of your normal routines is an exhausting sort of way. I just came back from Europe a couple of weeks ago identifying with this, uh, this, uh, this uh, exhaustion. Jesus pays attention to them. He listens very carefully and wholeheartedly. He's ministering into them. Um, but then, then, then uh, verse, verse 34 Jesus had compassion when he saw the crowds. And so he then extends himself with the use of his disciples out to these crowds, and he taught them. He gave them wisdom. He healed them. Notice that even before he gave the food, he was giving of his time, right? He was sacrificing, uh, maybe even sacrificing what he would have humanly preferred to be doing uh, because they were hungry because they were in need, because they were people that were looking for what he had to give, and he gave it to them because he had compassion. This week we have an election, and hear, hear the point I want to make on this, okay? Okay? And please don't turn it into a political thing, but it's pertinent also into um, being, being applied in our time. Um, there are lots of evangelical believers that will vote for President Trump because they say he stood up for abortion. And that will be as far as they think into it, okay? And it's true that Trump appointed the Supreme Court justices that overturned the Roe v. Wade. But the strange thing that happened is that the number of babies that were aborted did not drop after that happened. Let me just suggest that the presence and power of God was not part of the government leaders' decisions in that case. Now, the grassroots movement, <laughs> mothers praying compassionately for the for uh, unborn to be given life, yes, the compassion of God is present. But the issue was used and abused because it was not done in compassion and thoughtfulness, but was done to take advantage and to be exploiting and to be um, uh, uh, using for causes of power rather than to be used in compassion for the cause of the unborn. And so the prosperity of God could not be upon it. The numbers did not drop, surprisingly. Now, I believe that it's God's heart that babies in the womb are born. So I'm, not, I'm, 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 I'm upholding that value. But remember that in case where that doesn't happen, that Jesus' heart goes toward you and says, neither do I condemn you. Go and live in my community, in my church, and find resources around you to be uh, ministering. And I'm looking at you, dear sister, and know that you've ministered powerfully into this very act of Christian compassion and grace. So compassion is the move of the Holy Spirit within us, touching out into the lives and making a difference. And we do it because it's the heart of Christ Jesus. It, and it doesn't matter what the particular law of the land says is allowed or isn't allowed. The, the grace of Jesus captures our hearts. And first of all, we follow that call, right? That call to say we become Jesus people. And we are there to be ministering in the generosity and grace of God and allow the compassion to be expressed wherever the Lord brings our attention. As Pastor Kia says several times about the food pantry, um, you say yes, and then you figure out how. When God puts the appointment in front of you, you say yes to that, because you know there's going to be a compassionate move of the Spirit of God that is there. 
And so in physical food, now finding new ways to be ministering into people in other areas of their life. So let me just say to you, if you're compassionate for hungry people, come to the food pantry. If you're compassionate for spiritually hungry people, come on Wednesday and meet in this room. Compassion to our children, serve them on Sunday morning in this hour. Compassion for God's earth and the facility, upkeep. You already heard Greg talking about that. This notice of stirring the compassion in our hearts, reaching into the generosity in our response. Let's just come back to this fact. God gave His Son, His only Son. The Son lived His whole life full of compassion and giving of Himself. And then that Son gave His life. What generous, sacrificial, compassionate, surrendering hearts. And then the question is, how will we continue to live in that flow, right? How will we continue to live in that God-like way of ministering His grace, of ministering the grace of His compassion and generosity out to the hands of others? We want to dwell on that a bit this morning as we celebrate communion together about God's great, gracious compassion and giving His Son and Jesus' great compassion of giving His life for us and that we're asked to receive into that and then extend it to others. We can have the worship team come forward and have some music supporting us. The um, uh, persons who are uh, ready to uh, serve us, the elements can, can come forward as well. So as we come before the Lord's table this morning, we're doing it from a heart of saying we're receiving, we're taking into ourselves your generous, compassionate heart so that we can be sharing, seeing that multiplied with others as well.